So several months ago, I made a video about simulating an epidemic, and they were toy models, they weren't all that sophisticated, but I do think that there's some insight that you can gain by tweaking the parameters in these kinds of simulations. Now, this week and next week for homework, we're going to have you implement some very simple models that are kind of analogous to what I did, but hopefully actually more sophisticated. So what I thought I would do in this lecture is kind of a director's cut of that video, but I'll talk about the implementation details and some of the thoughts behind what went into it, because that's going to be directly relevant to the project that you'll be working on for the next week or two. What you'll be writing is something known as an SIR model. So S here stands for susceptible. It describes a kind of person that might be in your model. Similarly, I stands for infectious. Um, and then R stands for recovered or sometimes removed. And the idea is that you kind of transition from this first state towards the other. Susceptible people catch the disease, uh, people who catch the disease eventually recover, or they're removed from the simulation. All that matters is whether or not they're changing the phase of the S folk into the I folk. Now, the way that I wrote things here was to have the infectious people have kind of a radius around them for who they might influence. So if someone is infectious, then you consider everyone else who's in that radius from them. So we'll have them wandering throughout a town like you'll see in a moment. And for each amount of time that someone susceptible spins within this radius of someone infectious, there's some probability that they transition from the S state into the I state. So you leave them there long enough, you're kind of rolling the dice long enough that eventually they're definitely going to catch it. But if they're only temporarily near someone, it's less likely. Um, and then to transition from the I state to the R state, uh, there's different ways that you could go about this. But what I did is basically say there's a certain amount of time that you're infectious. There's just a set parameter. And after that amount of time, you transition from being infectious to instead being uh, recovered or removed or whatever you want to consider that R state. So just already right here, there's a couple questions of implementations for, you know, whether this is an accurate model or if it even stands to be. Maybe the biggest thing to note here is that we're using proximity as a proxy for um, all the kinds of interactions you might have with someone. Um, but, you know, maybe that's not actually what you want. Maybe you want to have a little more sophistication where you take into account how people are interacting when they're close, not just that they're close. Because if you're kissing someone, that's obviously very different than if you're having, you know, a conversation with masks on or something like that. But if we're willing to use something as a proxy for how connected are people, how likely are they to infect each other, then uh, what we can do here is just try to simulate some notion of um, how people are interacting. So with that as a setup, the initial dynamic that I went with here was to have all of the characters do kind of a random walk around a town. So we're modeling a bunch of different agents. Each of the agents has a state. Each of those states can affect the states of the agents around it. Um, but in order to introduce some notion of randomness and mixing here, we're just having them wander around. And I'm doing something slightly more sophisticated than a random walk that is purely for aesthetic reasons. This has no influence on the model. But rather than having them discreetly step from one point to another, I'm having them kind of gravitationally pulled to a given point. And then each one of those points that they're gravitationally pulled to will occasionally randomly um, pop into a different direction. So that gives kind of a smooth random walk type thing. Now, if you step back to the epidemiology and you ask, you know, in what sense does this possibly model what real people do? The most honest answer here has to be that it's really not that accurate. Right? Most people have social circles. There's a certain small number of people that are the regular ones they interact with, not just random samplings from the town. There are certain central hubs, things like restaurants or schools, uh, grocery stores that um, people go to that uh, bring them together. So any more accurate model is going to want to take into account that kind of structure that there is between people. And a random walk model like this is essentially trying to get some notion of mixing in there that's not as crazy as saying any given person in the population has some likelihood of interacting with any other. There is some notion of proximity, but it doesn't involve as much um, legwork, frankly, as proper epidemiological modeling to get some notion of what the real social networks are and what the real geographic structures are around people. So as you build your models, you do want to be aware of the assumptions that you're making and also keep in the back of your mind what you could do to buff them up in the future if you do want to start doing that legwork. Now, if it feels a little disheartening to throw up our hands and say, well, these models really aren't that accurate, uh, there's two things that I can tell you that are a little redemptive for this kind of play. Um, the first is that the goal here is not to say, oh, let's look at these wandering dots, let's look at the um, spread of the epidemic, and assume that that's going to be modeled in anything that happens um, in the real world. But what we can do is say, let's consider the parameters we have at our disposal, things like the duration of the illness or this radius of infection, which is a kind of proxy for how infectious is it. And once we have that, and it's well-defined in the computer, 
we can start asking, how does tweaking that parameter affect the qualitative features of the spread that we see here? Even if it's a stretch to say that these randomly wandering dots mimic reality, it's less of a stretch to say the kind of qualitative changes we see by changing our parameters match the sort of changes that we would see in a real epidemic. So for example, let's say I take this model and I'm gonna double the radius of infection, which remember was our proxy for how infectious this disease is. So rather than infecting the immediate neighbors, you're kind of infecting just more of the neighbors around you. If you do that, then let's take a look at what happens to the spread of our toy epidemic. It goes, it's quite the confl conflagration, conflagration. Um, and for this little box that has a thousand dots or so, what we end up getting is a moment when almost everybody is infectious at once. Almost everybody has the disease at once. Now, even if this is a tiny society with a thousand dots that are behaving in a way that we wouldn't, there is some lesson to be had in just how different the shape of that curve was from the shape of um, what we got just with the default state before we doubled that infection radius. So again, for comparison, and I guess I should talk through what the graphs themselves are showing. Maybe that's self-evident, but it's, um, it's worth saying here. At each step, at each time step of our simulation, we're counting how many people are infectious, how many are susceptible, and how many are removed. Um, and then what we're doing is basically stacking those quantities on top of each other with each vertical bar in this graph and then letting it evolve for time. Um, one thing I'll say actually that I, I wish I had done differently, um, and someone had suggested this, but it was pretty late in the game where I had already kind of made all of these animations and simulations. Um, we should have packaged together or we should have ordered them a little bit differently. The susceptible slice should have been on the top and then maybe infectious below it and then removed at the bottom. One, so that that shows the actual progression, kind of you're going from the top to the bottom. But also, if you see the removed stacked together with the infectious, what you're looking at is a graph of how many people have ever had it, maybe now, maybe in the past, and that you would see a nice logistic growth, potentially, depending on your model. Um, but here it's much, much harder to see that logistic growth um, unless you get to a point where all of the infectious uh, kind of go to zero, and then you see it as this upside down thing in the removed graph. So that's one thing just stylistically I wish I had done differently. But back to the original um, point here, if you compare the shape of this curve to the shape of what happens when we tweak one of the parameters, that's one of the interesting things to study. That's one of the interesting things we can ask questions about. In a similar vein, having all of the parameters of our epidemic encoded into the simulation like this might let us play with what happens if the probability of inflect of uh, <laughs> if the probability of infection, excuse me, gets cut in half. So let's say while our susceptible agents are within the specified radius of an infectious agent, rather than the probability at each time step being 0.2, say, which I guess I had it coded here, um, of being infected, let's say it drops to 0.1, we can ask what effect does that have on the overall model, um, on the runs that we do. So let's take a look here. As you might expect, it actually slows things down. But what's noteworthy is actually how much it slows things down. And one thing that I would want you to think about um, as you're putting together simulations like this is what can you try to quantify? What numbers can you look at that are giving some direct way to compare one run of the simulation with another? Because right here we can get you know a very human qualitative look at saying, oh yeah, it's taking a lot longer for everyone to um, get the disease. But preferably with each simulation, you'd have some hard numbers that you can output that give you certain stats to that effect. Um, now, this actually brings us to the second thing, which I think um, is a little bit redeeming about doing toy models, even though you know that they differ from reality. Um, and that's to try to take certain quantities which can be studied in reality, like the much talked about now are not value, and then looking at that in your simulation and tweaking the simulation to make sure that values like that match the measurements that you're taking in reality if you want to model a particular disease. So just to take a sidestep and talk about this value R and R naught and the reproductive rate, let me jump to a couple other animations I have here which are aimed at explaining just that. All right, great. Um, so let's say that you've got someone who's infectious, they're going around, they're spreading the disease, which is problematic, and you count everybody who they've infected, you know, while they were infectious, before they recovered from the disease. So in this case, the top little agent there went and he infected three other um, people who were susceptible. He touched four, but he only infected three. Um, if we count that for the person who's infectious, and then we average that across everybody who's infectious, we call that value the reproductive number, or R. Now, one thing you might have heard a lot more about is R naught, 
and this is very similar, it's effectively what is the reproductive number in a population where everyone is susceptible. So in this case, where our little agent went and interacted with four different people, um, if all four of them had actually been susceptible, or we assume everyone's susceptible, in that case, you know, he would have infected four different people. So this gives kind of an apples to apples way to compare one disease to another um, if one happens to be particularly well spread in the population already, but another one is just getting its start. You say, okay, in a completely clean situation, what would the reproductive rate be at, you know, time step zero, R naught? So in our simulations, you know, we can calculate that. We can try to take a look at what's going on with each of the agents and come up with some way to quantify this reproductive rate. So as an example, um, the way that I think I wrote it here was I looped through every one of the infectious cases, okay, kind of went through, said, of all my agents um, who have uh, the status I for infectious, I'm going to count how many transfers you've made so far. How many people have you infected? Which means every time an infection happens, that's a little thing that I've got to track. Um, and then the way I did it, at least, I said, we're going to estimate how many you will have infected in total uh, based on the duration of the illness. So if you've only been infectious for one day, but I know you're going to be infectious for about five days and you've infected, you know, one person, um, I'll assume I'm going to project that out that you will infect by the end, you know, five different people. Um, and then we average that across all of the people who are infectious. We do that computation, we count that number and we average it. Uh, that's what I was using to calculate this little R value. And then in each and every one of the simulations, I was showing that R value just to give some sense of how does the toy model epidemic that we're looking at right now compare to things you might actually read about in the news. And I deliberately tried to make it so that that R value in our default case um, loosely mapped to what we knew about the reproductive value for COVID-19. Um, or maybe I should say reproductive value for SARS-CoV-2. I guess you spread the virus, not the disease. Um, but in either case, uh, that's, that gives you some little hook that you can try to have into reality itself, even while you acknowledge that the models are making some necessarily simplifying assumptions because, you know, fully accurate modeling of social dynamics might be completely infeasible if, uh, depending on what, you know, level of resources you have at your disposal. So with that in mind, we can look back at something like, hey, uh, what was happening um, just in the default case? You know, we tuned things and we said we tried to make it about um, 2 or 2.2, uh, something that mirrors uh, what measurements were taken for COVID-19. And then you can say, when we do that tweak to our parameters that we had before, like doubling the radius, rather than just asking, you know, what does the graph look like? Does it look much worse? We can ask, what effect does this have on R, right? And in that case, you know, doubling the radius, which effectively quadrupled the uh, exposure that each agent had, unsurprisingly made that value R jump up to um, something about four times as high, which was about eight. An interesting thing to note here is shortly after the beginning, um, that reproductive value seems to be dropping. It's going to 6.39 and then from there to 6.1. Um, and what's happening there is that a lot of the infectious people have already infected those immediate neighbors of theirs. And because this is a random walk, it's not a well-mixed model where they're interacting with anyone in the city. It's just those right next to them. Um, a lot of them are no longer doing any more infections. They've kind of exhausted their immediate social circles, which actually does map to what would happen in an epidemic, um, depending on how well, how well mixed a city is. You know, some people might just have that close inner circle of who they interact with. And then once they're infected, they no longer... Um, spread it as much. Oh, and um, when, yeah, part of the reason that we like this number R, it's kind of a nice intuitive one to think about. If R is greater than one, that means that things are growing and they're growing exponentially. Um, and that's actually when we call it an epidemic. That's how we define the notion of an epidemic. Whereas a disease is called endemic if R is around one, meaning each person who's infectious infects only one other person. So the total number of people infected um, doesn't really change. It doesn't really uh, grow the way that an epidemic does. Um, and then if it uh, is the other way around, if R is less than one, then things are on their way out. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think there's actually a word for this, but uh, I guess just as a half joking thing in the video, um, just for a brief second, I thought like, we should call this hypodemic. We should call it a hypodemic um, disease when we're able to measure that the reproductive rate is below R, sorry, is below one, but I guess we don't do that. Most of the actual content of the video came down to tweaking this basic random walk model to try to have it do more interesting things that were at least some loose resemblance to um, questions about reality and what real people do and how changing those actions of real people influences the graphs that we're looking at, showing you know how many people are infectious at once, how many people get affected overall. So for example, you know one of them that I had was 
kind of a travel simulation where we have several different cities and then with some probability people are traveling from one city to another. Now, when you look at something like this and you start mapping out, okay, how do I want to um, create this as you're writing it, as you'll be doing in the homework, uh, you want to start thinking about all of the different types that you're going to have to create, all of the different um, entities that interact with each other. So in this case, you know, the main type is some kind of agent, something that has a status of susceptible, infectious, or um, recovered. Uh, that status can evolve with each time step. So there's some notion of stepping through time and going through all the agents and asking how they should be updated. In this case, those agents also have a spatial location, so they'd have to keep track of their spatial location and how that should be updated as they're walking around. It doesn't have to be as smooth as I chose to make it here for aesthetic reasons. It could just be like very simple walks in some random direction. Um, if you're going to have cities like this, then that's a different type. And those cities themselves have um, a notion of, you know, what agents are within them. What is the transition probability to go from one city to another? And that's another thing that needs to be taken into account at each time step. You know, not only is there a probability of infection if you're next to someone who's infectious, but there's a probability of traveling and all of those things. So even if it is a relatively simplified model, as you start to get into the nitty gritty of making it happen, I think you'll find that there's plenty of nuances and plenty of complexity to deal with, even in a circumstance like this. Another fun thing to play around with um, was the idea of social distancing and what that might look like in this sort of random walk model. So something about pie creatures yelling at each other for whatever was happening in the narration right there. Um, so what I did here is just have some kind of repulsion between the agents. And at this point, we're playing much more in the ground of particle simulation than we are with epidemic simulation. But the idea was that this is something where when we turn it on, there's a lot less interaction happening between the agents. But because they're still trying to do their random walk, they've got their little gravitational pulls, they do kind of jiggle towards each other and occasionally infect, but it's just much less common. And again, this is something that I will fully admit was mostly... Um, not mostly, but it was motivated largely by aesthetic reasons. You know, you have this extremely visceral feel for social distancing when it's entities in a box literally pushing each other away. Um, whereas in reality, social distancing means something more like staying in your home. But again, let's say that this is something that you find yourself modeling in whatever toy simulations you build. Um, and you want to know, you know, how far afield from reality is this? measure something, measure something quantitative in your model, like this reproductive rate, and see if that matches with research that people have done regarding uh, what actual social distancing, people staying in their home, can do to the reproductive rate of an epidemic like this. So if you'll notice in all of our little simulations here, we've got this R value calculated, and up in the upper left where every single person is trying to social distance, it looks like R right now is 1.22. Um, over where we have 90% of people doing it, R is 1.3. Uh, where only 70% of people are, R is 1.38. So if you wanted to predict which one of these most accurately mirrors what people do in reality, a good starting point would be to say which one of these R values matches with something that's actually been measured. Something which is a little bit easier to play with in just about any model that you have, this doesn't depend on it being a random walk or um, anything like that, would be to ask what happens if you can identify people who have the disease, you know, at some point before they've completely gotten over it, and then remove them from the simulation, effectively as if you were to quarantine the people who test positive. So in the case of trying to visualize it and doing something that you can put on screen, uh, the way I had this work is that people were um, put into a quarantine zone after some amount of time with some probability if they had it. And one fun side note, just about how I wrote these simulations that, again, this has no bearing on reality, but it was kind of a funny consequence. Uh, you'll notice here how all of the ones who remained infectious were towards the left half of the box. Uh, that is not a coincidence. Um, it's because kind of the naive way that I went about doing this, motivated by trying to make it visual, not by um, something that mirrors reality again, um, was that I'm physically just moving the dots uh, to that box in an animated way. It's happening over time. So like the sort of side effect is that as they're transitioning towards that quarantine zone away from wherever they started, they spend some time passing through that intermediary spot. And in that intermediary spot, they might actually infect some people along the way, which is what happened. And I remember thinking about this while making the simulations and wondering like, ah, should I try to change that? Like during the animation, turn off all of the updates that happen with each time step for whether they're infecting someone or not. 
But ultimately, I kind of like how it mirrored the imperfections with actually trying to quarantine someone. I mean, like the process of testing someone, you're actually exposing them to a lot of other people. They're going to a testing center. You do the best that you can to keep those people isolated. But, you know, things aren't perfect. So the very act of um, trying to treat things like this sometimes does have these ancillary effects. And I liked that that happened somehow in the model, even if it was in this absurd way um, that has more to do with the way that it was animated than it has to do with any mirrorings of reality. But that was just kind of a fun side note there. In whatever simulations you make, you know, you can imagine all you have to do for this is at your time steps, um, in the same phase where you're deciding whether or not someone recovers, you can have some notion of deciding whether or not they are identified and quarantined. Um, you could even have an idea of testing and running a test on people that has some kind of false positive rate um, or just some probability of whether someone is even going to be tested because we don't test 100% of the population. So one of the things that I did was to say, you know, what if we have um, have this kind of quarantine, but only some of the infectious cases are noticed, um, maybe because some of them are asymptomatic. So in this case, 80% of the cases when they are created, when the infection happens, turn into little red dots, and those red dots are quickly identified and put into that quarantine zone. Um, but 20% of them ended up being, oh wait, no, I guess I was running an earlier one here. Okay, so whatever runs next. Yes, okay, here we've got um, some of them are red dots, and uh, those are the ones that after a certain threshold are going to be quarantined. Um, but then 20% of them will be yellow dots, and those yellow dots uh, they just go through the full infection cycle. They go through the full however many days it takes to recover, never being noticed, never being put into the quarantine zone. And so a question that you can ask, which I think is kind of interesting, is to say, as we tweak the number of asymptomatic cases like this, what does it do to the overall effectiveness of identifying and isolating people? Um, and at least in these toy simulations, one of the interesting things to note was when we had something like the travel simulation where people are going to the center of another city, even just 20% of the cases really prolonged the spread of things so that even though the height of the curve never got that high, so not too many people were infected at once, um, the percentage of people who were ultimately affected in this little toy model um, was quite a bit higher than it was when 100% of the people were identified and isolated. And when you did it where 50% of the people went about asymptomatic, it was almost no different, um, which I found kind of surprising. You know, have this nonlinear effect in how many people leak through your testing system, um, a nonlinear effect for how that influences the overall caseloads. So these are just some of the questions that I asked while I was putting this together, you know, several months ago. And mostly I bring this all up to try to encourage you as you're putting together your own simulations to ask your own questions. Ask what would you have to add on to the model in order to answer those questions? What concrete numbers can you try to put on your simulation so that you can compare apples to apples? And just let yourself be curious. I guarantee that there's a satisfaction that you're going to feel as you're building this kind of thing from the ground up and as you find yourself able to tweak some of the parameters to ask these questions. And it really changes how you view the models that you see in the world, either the um, kind of illustrative toy ones like I might make or the more professional ones that you see from real epidemiologists. Having your own history with it does influence how you read those papers.